Keith here. When I started making the first episode of, I had no experience doing podcast interviews, especially the technical side of things. It was a lot of confusing steps, setting up double enders or making do with low quality recordings on whatever app I could figure out. But it got a whole lot easier when I started using Zencaster. Made for podcasts with Zencaster, it's so easy to do everything. You and your guests log in with a browser and record studio quality sound and up to 4K video, even with an unstable connection. And it's an all-in-one deal. You don't need a lot of different tools or services. With Zencaster, you can create your podcast all in one place and distribute it to Spotify, Apple, and other major platforms. If you've ever thought about making your own podcast, go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code TFEO and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experience I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story on Zencaster. Hey, it's Keith. If you're a lover of audio drama like I am, you need to know about the Apollo app. Apollo is designed around audio drama, so finding your next story is easy. You can always listen through Apollo for free, but there's also the Apollo Plus subscription. With it, you get ad-free listening, exclusives, and other bonus content for over 40 shows. And 70% of the revenue on Apollo Plus goes to those creators. Join Apollo Plus through the Apollo Podcasts app or apollopods.com. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of a podcast about audio drama and the creative process. I'm W. Keith Timms, audio drama producer and podcaster. It's our two-year anniversary, and this week we're doing something a little different. Instead of interviewing an audio drama creator, I'm talking with Evo Terra, podcast Hall of Fame inductee, co-author of Podcasting for Dummies, and audio drama aficionado. Evo is also celebrating an anniversary. One year ago, he began publishing The End, a weekly newsletter that curates audio fiction podcasts that have completed their run or a full season. Though he doesn't make an audio drama himself, with years of experience in the podcasting world, Evo offers a different perspective on the state of the audio drama industry, resources for listeners, and how creators can make the most of their projects. I spoke to Evo remotely from his home in Arizona. Evo Terra, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you could be here. One of the things I really like about us getting a chance to talk is that I kind of feel like we're bookends in a certain <laughs> way. That this show is, you know, the beginning. When I look at the first episodes of audio dramas and talk with the creators. And you, of course, are the producer of The End newsletter, where you mm -hmm. take a look at completed shows. So I'm really happy to have this chance to talk and take a look at the way things work in the industry and, and share perspectives with you. Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be great. And you're right. We, we certainly do it on, on, on both ends. So we got you covered, people. Here we are. <laughs> Excellent. Before we jump in and start talking about our mutual love of audio drama, I'm curious about your background in not just in audio and in the arts, but in general. Can you tell me a little bit about where you come from and the path you took to get to where you are today? Yeah, I, I'll talk about this path because no one should follow it. Uh, okay. That's my, my first <laughs> advice, right? Um, yeah, I've, I've been a person who likes to wander. There's that whole saying, all those who wander are not lost. Boy, yeah. that was me uh, <laughs> all the way through the double nickel years I've been on this planet. That has pretty much been my life, kind of exploring everything. Grew up in a really, really small town, got out as quickly as possible and moved to a slightly larger town, Los Angeles, uh, where I realized, oh, I'm in, a, I'm in a much better place. But I've bounced around all over that. In fact, I've even bounced around overseas, as you might know, Keith, in 2015. My wife and I both had a shared midlife crisis and decide to sell everything that we owned, literally, and just travel the world for a year wow. living in people's homes. Uh, we did house sitting internationally, so it wasn't quite couch surfing, but it was very much like that. We hit 15 countries over that first year was and three continents. And then when we were done with that, we decided to go uh, live in Thailand for three years because why not? <laughs> and we came back to the States in, uh, in 2018 because we had a granddaughter on the way and she's here now. And so uh, we are back in Phoenix uh, where the, our son and the kids and all that stuff are. What did you like about traveling? 
traveling. Actually, traveling is the worst part of traveling, to be really honest with you. That whole stuff about it's not the journey, it's the destination. It's not the destination, it's the journey. Wrong. Right. <laughs> uh, to, to ask somebody who sits on a 15-hour flight from Bangkok to Helsinki, Finland, how great the travel, the journey is, no. Um, but going all the different places and seeing different people and just realizing how everybody in the world is pretty much like everybody else in the world. I mean, sure, there are differences, but I was really more struck with the similarities because we're living in people's homes. So, you know, we're, we're buying groceries at the grocery store. We're going to the movie theater in Hong Kong. Do you have any background in the arts? I know that you are not a maker of audio dramas, but I, I am curious because you do seem to be very invested in them. What draws you to the arts? Yeah, I I did a minor amount of acting. I was uh, I was actually in a commercial for uh, Sprite in Pakistan, believe it or oh, not. How I, fun. I, I, yeah, they did that when I was in bank. I got cast for that. So I've done a very little amount of that. I once tried my hand at writing fiction and I suck at it, uh, <laughs> but I'm pretty good at writing nonfiction. I've got a five books published nonfiction title, okay. including a little book called Podcasting for Dummies, which came Indeed. out in 2005. Um, I'm a big fan of improv. I, I work locally with an improv AZ and we've done a lot of fun, little weird things that are not your traditional stuff. But the, the big draw for me with audio dramas and the overarching audio fiction is that fiction is my jam. I only read science fiction books these days. Most of the television that I watch is a sci-fi series or, or some other sort of fictional series. It's the movies that I watch and entertain. It's just been what I've really drawn to. Way back in, in 2005, I was interviewing science fiction authors primarily, some fantasy authors and other genre, but mostly sci-fi authors. Uh, that was before podcasting hit. Uh, and mm -hmm. then when it finally launched, I was talking to everybody that I had met and became friends with all these authors and told them about this magical thing called podcasting. The next year, we decided to help authors with using a podcast as a promotional tool. And the way we would do that is, is this is before there was an Amazon Kindle, is mm -hmm. we would have them record their book as an audio book, but break it up into chapters. And we would send those chapters out as a podcast, as an individual episode. It was a very novel thing at the time in 2005 when, uh, when we did this. And you know, back then, it was very much audio book style content. The vast majority was a single narrator reading their book word for word. And then we would, it would just be broken up into, into individual episodes. And we had like 700 titles at the heyday of this thing. It really took off. People loved it because the creators were, had a way to get their content out into the world that they just didn't have before. And the people who like to listen to audiobooks, this was back when audiobooks cost you $60 and you would buy it, give 12 CDs. Oh, right. <laughs> they were delivered. Right. It was a total nightmare. So we have a much more convenient option, even though it was a podcast and that was its own challenge back in the early days. So that went really, really well uh, for, for the longest time. And that's what really kind of solidified my world of, of how can I blend my love of podcasting, the thing I do full time for a living, and also my massive consumption of fiction. Uh, let's let's do those together as a podcast. So that's that's how it started. And that's where we're at still today. Yeah. So you, you were a very early adopter of podcasting yeah. for the, in the when the medium itself came into the into being. You co-founded Podio Books. And as you mentioned, you, you co-offered the first edition of Podcasting for Dummies. I'm really curious as to what drew you to podcasting in this particular media. What is it like that you like about this that has held your interest such? Mostly luck. To be really honest with you, um, I used to do audio editing. My, my first real job in college was working for a multimedia production company. And so I learned to do audio. And that's back when I had a four track reel to reel machine, quarter mm -hmm. inch tape and literally cut tape and <laughs> the real way of doing things. So that's what I did all through college. Several years later, I got asked to be a guest of a, at, at the time, an internet radio show. It wasn't a podcast. It was an internet radio show because this was back in 2002. And I did that and me and the host had really good chemistry together. And so I decided to become the co-host of that show. And it was a show where we interviewed science fiction authors. We did that for two years before we even heard about podcasting. And we heard about podcasting. And so the good news for us is we already had a blog that had an RSS feed. And right. we were already making our episodes available in distributable formats because we were on six different terrestrial radio stations and XM satellite back in the day. So we already had everything. I just had to hack together how to make the enclosure 
tag work, which didn't work, uh, <laughs> but I, I faked it. <laughs> I was, I'm a good enough hack to fake that. So we launched our podcast on October 14th, 2004 with 135 back episodes. Nice. We won. <laughs> we, yeah. we just flooded it in the early days, you know, and uh, that's that's how the, the, the podcasting thing began. And then I got the opportunity to write podcasting for dummies from one of those authors I had met and became friends with. He, he got asked by his agent to write it. Uh, he called me and said, hey, I've been asked to write this book. And I said, why did they ask you? <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. I literally will do everything for you. And he said, I know. I want you to write about that. Oh, okay, great. So uh, we teamed up together and wrote it. And yeah, podcasting is, uh, it's what I've been doing for the last, goodness, almost 20 years now. That's great. What made you want to start focusing on audio drama specifically in the podcast medium? I run a company called Simpler Media, and we make podcasts for businesses, uh, mm -hmm. boring business podcasts, I like to call them, right? Just <laughs> very utilitarian. They've got a job to do, fit for purpose type content. Uh, and, and we do that all day in and day out. And, and I make a lot of those shows, but it's not what I listen to. You know, what I listen to is mostly audio fiction, and, and it has mm -hmm. been for the for the longest time. It's been my primary listening. If you look through my app, it's all, well, today it's only only uh, audio fiction, audio drama stuff. But, you know, even for the last five or six years, it's, it's been that way. That's what I love. And I don't love making them, obviously, because that's not what I do. But I really love helping people find the good content. And that's really what I was struggling with last year, about, about a year and a half ago, is what is a way for me to go into this space and talk about shows that I love? And one of the things that I love uh, about podcast fiction is shows that are complete. So I know that there are some shows that are just simply ongoing anthologies mm -hmm. that never, ever take a break. And that's fine. No, we have Welcome to Night Vale and we have Starship right. Sofa and all these things. And those are great and those are fine. But I like self-contained stories, either at a season or an, or, or an entire series or a season level. I knew I wanted to showcase the good stuff, but I only wanted to showcase good stuff that was done. And it was at Podcast Movement 2023. I, I asked around a, a lot of the audio creators that I met there, some of which I've been friends with for years. Some were brand new to me and kept probing around the edges of this idea of featuring finished fiction, if you will. Mm -hmm. And all of them said, that's a really cool idea. So I said, this needs to be a newsletter. And here we are a year later. And we're keeping on doing it. Since we're talking about the newsletter, why don't yeah. you tell us what The End is and how people can find it? Finding it is very simple. The End dot FYI. I am a huge fan of these new generic top level domains. If I never <laughs> yeah. buy a dot com again, it'll be yeah. too soon. Yeah. The End dot FYI is where it is. And The End is a weekly newsletter. It publishes every Thursday. It features or highlights the following types of content. First off, everything in here is complete, either complete at the season level. So season one is finished. Season one of finale has been published and season two is coming soon. Or the entire series is completed, whether that was a single season or multiple seasons, that's fine. But that is done. That show is completed. Third thing that can be have in there are things that are coming soon. Not, not brand new shows coming soon, but seasons second and more, second, third, fourth, fifth seasons, shows that have already had one season out there that are now coming back within the next month or so. I will highlight those shows as well. And, and the newsletter is hopefully very digestible. I mean, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. The, the first two things you see are two of my own recommendations, These are my personal <laughs> recommendations for great audio fiction that I personally love. You may not love it. <laughs> I do. And I try to explain why I love it as part of that. Uh, but everything else that's listed is based, based on submissions. So if you're a creator and you are nearing the end of your series or your end of your first season or second season, whatever it is, then go to the end.fyi, click the little button that says submit your fiction. I ask you questions that will take you less than two minutes to fill out. Most of the stuff I get out of the RSS feed. How many shows do you have? in your database or your collection now about? Oh, my goodness. Let's see. I, 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 there are 600 was the number that I got to. Yeah. The week we're recording this, you and I, the 53rd issue will be publishing soon. And it has uh, 17 uh, titles uh, in, this, in this week's issue. Yeah. And, and that reminds me, I do want to congratulate you on a year. Of, Thank you. Uh, the end. As I'm celebrating my second anniversary. Yeah, here that's well. fantastic. So, How, yeah. We, we just timed it perfect so that we started we by the same time. <laughs> we did. With so many audio dramas, you know, and of course, this is just scratching the surface, but it seems to me like the, this industry is really wide open, especially lately. One of the things that I've noticed when I started doing the first episode of interviews is that a lot of the people that I talked to got started during COVID, that mm. there was people were out of work or they, they, or at home, especially a lot of creative types who, who couldn't go to the set. 
or couldn't go to the theater. And so they wanted to keep their hand in the arts. And so they started yeah. making audio drama. There's a lot of, of shows. I almost want to say it's like a renaissance of a kind or at least a bloom. How do you see the audio drama space and the industry these days? Yeah, it's a evolving target. <laughs> it, yeah. it moves all the time, you know, and you're right. The lockdowns that we all had to go through certainly spurred a lot of creativity. Uh, I know a, a lot of theater people really embrace this medium, which I think is wonderful because they can really do a lot without having to have all of their actors get together on the same stage. They could do it all remotely. There's a lot to learn when you're doing it that way. Yes. Uh, so that really spurred a lot of people to look at something electronic as a way to get people out there. I mean, I remember musicians who couldn't get together to record their albums were recording videos of four different people from their home studios all playing the same song. Right. And they would smash that together and, and upload it. It was, it was just amazing kind of, so this, this huge burst of creativity that was put on all of us who are creative people because we couldn't get out and do anything interesting. Mm. We had to find an outlet for it. It was wonderful. And it was very reminiscent to me of what happened in 2008, 2009, when the, uh, when the economy crashed the first time, right, for the housing crisis. Right. Lots of tech people were laid off. Lots of people were laid off uh, just in general, right? But a lot of technical people and even creative people found themselves without work. And they, they had this huge boom that would, what could come out, you know, new, interesting, cool, fun, interesting ideas, new businesses, new business models were being invented all the time because they had nothing else to do. And they're creative people. We saw that again in 2021 and 2022. And in fact, it's even continuing now. So yeah, I, I think it's great uh, from a creativity standpoint. I think people are getting doing some pretty interesting things out there. Yeah. It struck me actually, like, and not just audio drama creators, but like you mentioned, musicians, you know, there were people I talked to who they were stuck at home. And so suddenly it's like, well, I can't go to work. So they picked up their guitar they haven't touched in two or three years, yep. you know, or mm -hmm. they picked up the paintbrush or whatever. It just occurs to me, like, how different would our society be and how different would we be if we had more free time to devote mm. to the arts in our personal lives? That if we didn't have to be sort of you know, a slave to the work grind. And I know sometimes that's necessary. But yeah. um, if there was a way to free up some time for all of us to explore the arts, I think that would be a really interesting positive change. I think that would be amazing. We have no idea, no concept of what would come out of that, but probably some pretty cool stuff on the other end. And, and you're right, a lot of it is tied back to this Protestant work ethic or yeah. the Henry Ford, you know, this is what, a, a, you know, who says we have to be eight hours of work every day? Why, why is right. that the norm? Right. But that is the rule currently, but we're seeing a lot of people break that. Now we're starting to see a lot of people who've recognized, and I, and I saw it when I was traveling and I, a whole bunch of digital nomads in the, in the travel blogging space, specifically people who have found ways to get the income that they need, maybe not the income that they made previously, but the income that right. they need to live the lifestyle that they want and do very fun, cool, creative sorts of things. If someone were to ask you about what the state of the of the audio drama industry is today, sort of big picture, what would you tell them? I would tell them there are really three major buckets, if okay. you will. And some are more industry focused than others, right? So let's let's talk about the big elephant in the room, right? So that's the big shows that make big money, that have big budgets mm -hmm. that go behind them. And iHeartRadio comes to mind. You know, they are funding very interesting things with high-end talent from Hollywood who are reading mm -hmm. this kind of stuff, not just a lot of found stuff. Then you have another bucket, which is the indies. And I don't normally like the word indie in podcasting. I'm not sure what it means, but I think in, in fiction podcasting, in an audio drama space, it's a more, a, people have a good, better understanding of what that actually means. And, and indie can be super, super scrappy. Right. One person doing all the voices of their own show and putting it out there or, you know, they can have a small ish or even a large ish production company and figure out ways to get that done. And then the third bucket are people from the other side looking in people who either are from Hollywood that have not yet dipped their toes into the water, but have massive resources at their disposal. Uh, it could be audio production, audio book production companies who are looking at another distribution method that goes into. And the reason I use those three buckets is they all have three have very different paths and they don't 
seem to like each other very much. There is this weird infighting. You know, you're part of my group or you're not. You know, indies get snubbed by the big guys in Hollywood, and even the ones coming into Hollywood. They're just kind of clueless about life. So there's this weird trichotomy, I guess you will, of all three of these groups and playing. But I think they all have good things, right? Right now, the the big money players are learning value, valuable lessons in that a lot of the stuff was overpriced. And mm. that they, they are no longer have free access to money like they did previously when Spotify was buying up everything. So I think yeah. we're going to see the big production houses find ways to not spend ridiculous money on stuff and still tell a good story. Indie players, I think, are realizing they have to compete with the super high end audio that's coming out of the big Hollywood and even the new Hollywood trying to get into models. The good news is we now have tools and technologies at our disposal. You can make a show sounding every bit as good as the big people out there. You may, you may not be able to hire the same kind of talent, but if you have the right approach and attitude, you can get the whole thing done. So it's exciting. Uh, it's, it's an interesting time. I used to think that those three would eventually coalesce into one, but I've yet to see that happen. <laughs> So right. I'm just not really sure about it. But I guess that means the healthy ecosystem because we've got all these different ways that are playing. I was having a discussion on the Audio Drama Lab earlier today, similar to this kind of issue. One of the things that struck me about a lot of audio drama, especially those people who are trying to sort of look at this as a career and like making money and that kind of yeah. thing, which I count myself as one of those. There's a tendency, I think, for a lot of audio drama creators to think about audio drama as movies without sight. Mm -hmm. While I certainly can get that and I can understand that part of me is like but it's not the same medium that there's different things that audio drama can do compared to say film or live theater to me I feel like we ought to lean into that a little bit more while you can certainly have great production values and wonderful music and there are lots of shows that do that some of my favorite shows are intimate and quiet and very lightly designed and it still works really well because audio drama is such an intimate medium no you're you're, you're exactly right i think there are a lot of ways that you can play this game that is audio, the larger cool of audio fiction and with podcasting specifically it opens up opportunities that just don't exist in other mediums. And and you talked about movies as, as one yeah. of those, right? We're talking about this as a movie for your ears, and that's fine, but could you imagine listening to the original Conan the Barbarian, which has like six lines of dialogue? <laughs> Exactly. You know, that that is not a movie you want to listen to. That's just not, <laughs> just not it. But with podcasting, we don't have any rules. And so we are able to, I think, Cross all of those bridges. We can find, uh, you know, take the Conan script, for example, and we can re dramatize that. We can re script that so that there is something that is being spoken, adding a narrator's voice in to describe what's happening could, could be done. Uh, mm -hmm. We can take audiobooks and we can add sound effects to them and we can add soundscaping even more important so that there you get the essence you're trying to get as a creator can really, really come out when you do it that way. The other forms of media do not allow that as easily. You're, you're going against the grain when you try and do something different with a film or a television or a book, an audiobook, there are certain prescriptions that have been done around these. There's ways to do things that podcasting has always resisted. You know, mm -hmm. is it a, yeah. oh, I have a podcast. The hell does that mean? It doesn't mean anything right. at all about the type of content that you have. It could be a, a, a single monologue show, you know, two drugs with microphones, a 75 person <laughs> audio drama, a hugely in-depth true crime series. It can be anything, right? There's just so much we can do. And what I encourage creators to do is lean into that. Let your creativity shine through, not just in the content, but also through this medium. Anything you want, you can do as long as you can actually pull it off. And a podcast is a great way to experiment with that kind of stuff. And that's the other thing I like about this space is that at least right now, there are very few gatekeepers. Yeah. If you have a microphone and a computer and maybe a web hosting service, then you can tell your story. Yeah. That's exciting. It's a democratization, I think, of totally. storytelling. Totally yeah. agree with that. Yeah. So what advice would you give to people who maybe know very little about audio drama or have maybe haven't heard about it at all? And then, but they say, this sounds kind of interesting. What's your go-to advice for that? The challenge of listener experience is one that I think about a lot. And one of the reasons why I started The End, because if you're brand new to audio drama, You've never really done it before. Maybe you've heard some retellings of the War of the Worlds from way back in the day. That's about all you've got. But when you start going into audio drama, where do you go? Mm. 
I mean, yeah, you can pull up any of your podcast apps and there's audio drama in there, but what are you basing it off of? It reviews what comes to the top. You know, it's not really an algorithm that really works in this. So what bubbles to the top that would normally bubble to the top through social media really doesn't happen as much when you're in, in the podcasting space. So as a listener, they're already starting at a disadvantage is that they don't have a good place to go discover. Now, the good news is the number one discovery tool for all listeners of podcasting has word of mouth. And so if someone tells you about a show, it's a it's a good chance. Well, that, that is at least one recommendation. You may not love it, <laughs> but yeah. at least somebody had thought enough of that show to, to tell you about it. So that's where they normally go is if you're brand new to audio drama, you're not rich, just start asking friends of yours who you know listen to the content. But yeah, it is still initial discovery is, is a big challenge for a listener, number one. And number two. I'm going to put this back on the creators for a second. Go for it. Uh, creators don't always make it a good listening experience for new people. Explain that. Creators of fiction podcasts typically in their brains are thinking about my next episode is coming out next week. And everybody who's listening to this episode has already listened to the prior five or 50 or whatever the number happens to be there. They are in the same place I am Mm. with this content. And if I need, if I'm late by a week, I'll throw a weird episode drop in or something. I'll talk. And that's fine because these are my people. But what they fail to realize, and it's not just fiction podcasters, but fiction podcasters can do something about it. What they fail to realize is that every week, somebody brand new is listening to your show. Mm. One person every week has discovered your show and is starting hopefully from episode number one. Right. You might be on episode 50 right now, but they're on episode one and there's going to take them, you know, 50 listens which they're probably not going to do all in one sitting before they get to that 50th episode. So all those other things that made sense for you when you took that break between episodes 10 and 11, two years ago, and is still in your feed, doesn't make any sense for that new person coming in. How do they know your show is complete? Where, are they, where should they start? Is your website set up properly? So we, well, you, I'm going to talk to you, Keith, you and the rest of you fiction creators out there need to understand that the only thing that your current existing audience needs from you is a great next episode. But the rest of your efforts ought to be on making brand new people to your show feel welcome and invited and giving them an easy path to listen. What, in your opinion, is the best way that audio drama creators can do that? Make that first listener's experience the best possible way they can. I think there's a variety of things that you can do. And it, it starts with looking at your show, which is, consists of your website and your RSS feed primarily. Looking at it from a brand new person's eye. Trying your best to look at this. And you know when they first hit your website, even if your website is a really custom designed one, that's great. Or maybe it's just the you know standard free one you get when you use Spotify for podcasts, if that's what you want to use, which I don't recommend. But whatever, if you want to use, that's fine, right? When somebody hits that page first, do they know what's going on? Yeah. I mean, are you showing at the top of the page episode 50? I mean, when I read a book, I don't start at like a random chapter. Um, right. I started the first, right? And the same kind of deal here. We want to present that uh, to them the first way. So look at your site as the first piece of recommendation and said, is this a welcoming and inviting space for new people? Or like most of them, is it just an update for where I'm at in the process today? And hmm. that's not helpful. That second one is not what you want to do. Now, I don't think so. I think you wouldn't want it to do is you make it to where it works for a brand new person coming in so that they are part of the fold. And, and that's in, in how it looks. That's in the copy that you use. That's in how things are titled. Did you do a good job? And are you, did you set your feed to serial and are you using episode numbers all the way through it? Do you have a clearly marked trailer episode? that talks about and encourage people to listen and subscribe to the show. All of those sorts of things, which is super hard to do if yeah. you've been in it every single day. It is super hard to look at it with a fresh set of eyes and say, this is what it needs. This is what I need to change about my show. My old episodes, I can delete a bunch of episodes if I don't need them. You can do all of that stuff to make the experience better for the person who just started listening to your show today. Yeah. I want to backtrack just for a second. You were talking about discoverability and I realized yeah. that that is a, that is a problem for new listeners. There are a few apps that I think are trying to change the field, but I think they're kind of just still in the beginning phases and like Apollo, for example, yeah. is an app which is designed specifically about audio drama. Mm. And you've got other apps like Good Pods, which is attempting to be, I think, like you know, good reads for podcasts and yeah. that kind of thing. Do you see any progress being made in technology for that? I'm seeing progress, but and the progress is mostly limited to what you've talked about thus far. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the biggest challenge that is is the roadblock here, and that Apollo is trying to solve definitely, 
is that most podcast apps, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, whatever, right? Pick pick a podcast app. They have to be designed for the lowest common denominator. They have mm-hmm. to be designed to listen to everything. And the vast majority of podcasts are episodic in nature. So presenting the most recent episode is always the smartest thing to do. But that's a rarity in the fiction podcast world. And that requires just a different perspective. I mean, it mm. requires a different experience from the app. It's just not the same, like rating episodes. All these apps love to rate an episode. When was the last time, Keith, you rated a chapter of a book you read? Right. right. You just don't, right? I mean, no. so some of those things that make sense for podcasts don't make sense for audio fiction. So I love what Apollo is doing, making an app where the only thing that's in here is fiction. That's exciting to me, but we're going to need to see more of that. There's a lot of work that has to be done uh, to to make everything work. And here's what I want to try and talk to the technologists who might be listening to this thing. The reason I want you to make your app work better for fiction podcasts is there are roughly 60,000 fiction podcasts. That's an estimate that I got uh, from the podcast 2.0 guys. They ran a quick little numbers game and the number is about 60 grand, about 60,000 individuals who either are making or have made a piece of fiction in audio. By and large, a lot of those people who are creators are all listeners and they've got their favorite app, but they also know what a pain in the butt that new that their app is for somebody else. They've highly customized this thing to make it work. If you're a technologist and you make an app work really well for fiction podcasts so that a first time experience is perfect for them, for, for a brand new listener coming in, you make the perfect experience. You got 60,000 people that'll share that mm-hmm. with their yeah. existing audience. If someone could really make an app that is amazing for a fiction podcast, that one click to subscribe into it and they're listening and they get it, it's available on on all the platforms, man, oh man, that would be a game changer. And I think a good portion of the audio fiction community, if they were shown why it's better, would promote that for you for free. Uh, So what is the biggest mistake that you see audio drama creators make? Not listening. Some of the things you hit on earlier, Keith, um, you don't have to do everything the way that, again, I'll just use iHeart, uh, is producing content. You don't have to do that, but you have to understand that chances are the people who are going to listen to your content have listened to some of that stuff and they have certain expectations. And some of those expectations are that, well, you know, it not suck. (laughs) It's, it's an important thing. And I don't want to, I mean, look, I know a lot of people are just doing this because it's a passion and they want to, to get their story out there and it's fun. That's fine. Go ahead. I'm, I'm not, I'm never telling you not to do that. But if you really start asking the questions of, uh, you know, Hey, I would like to have more listeners. Are you sure? Did you make a show that is worthy of having listeners? I'm convinced that most podcasts get the audience they deserve. Hmm. That doesn't always happen that way, but the more care and feeding you can put into it, the better. But I hear from so many audio fiction people who don't realize that the quality of the audio is an important part of the story. No, it's the content. I I said it really great. Uh, I just had a buddy of mine who did some acting in middle school. He's just going to read everything out there. I don't get it on a cheap microphone, but it's fine because the story really matters. Uh, Nope. I mean, the container matters. I mean, why would I assault my ears to listen to a really good story uh, when I can listen to something that's a really good story that also sounds good and it's one click away in my app? Right. To be fair, obviously, you don't want to use a $10 microphone, but you can actually get a reasonable quality with just a moderate investment in equipment and also software. Without a doubt. Yeah. It just takes a little extra work, a little extra time. Now, I've I've heard some pretty amazing content for people who have cheap, terrible microphones. But what they did is they didn't try to do an epic fantasy story mm-hmm. with a cheap microphone. They wrote something that a cheap microphone was a bit. It was a part right. of the content. And right. it made sense. It was these weird, I can't remember the name of the show, but it was two people having conversations from their cell phone recordings. I don't care what the audio quality of the talking sounds are because it's supposed to sound like a phone. So I'm not going to ask you to play favorites because uh, I know you've got your, your personal list where we do see your recommendations. You do. But, That's right. But in general, what kind of audio dramas really appeal to you personally? So I'm a, I'm a big lover of sci-fi, but that's that's not the only thing uh, that I listen to. I, I think what I look for in audio drama is kind of the same thing I look for when I pick up a new book to read. And that is I need to be hooked early. I need to have a reason to keep listening. And me, perhaps more than most people, I need it because every week I'm getting 15 to 20 different submissions for the newsletter and I listen to everything. 
I don't mean mm-hmm. listen, I may not listen to the entirety of everything, but every single time somebody submits to me, I listen. So if something sounds good to me, I'll just add it to my podcast queue and listen to it. But that means I don't have a lot of time for you to get going. I like things that are buttoned up. I guess is yeah. is the word for it. I don't I don't have to have massive soundscaping. I don't have to have a huge cast. I listen to a lot of single narrator stuff that I'm a huge yeah. fan of. So yeah, just just make something that sounds good and, and captures my brain's interest, and and I would probably love your show. How do you measure success? You know, I have written about this. I used to be a podcast pundit before I was really into audio drama stuff and doing this, and I and I talk about that question. How do you define success? And everybody is different. You know, again, let's go back to the three buckets we talked about previously. You know, the, the big players, they're successful when they make money. The people in the middle, the indies. Look, the reality is most of you aren't going to make enough money to have a full-time job at making audio fiction. You're just not. It's, it's hard to do. Just why most people can't be full-time writers, even though you can write full-time. That doesn't mean you can make a full-time living at being writing. Right. So right. for you, success is a different metric, right? I think money is part of it, but also I don't think it has to be, well, look, I spent $75 on this stuff. I've got to make my $75 back. I don't think that's true. I mean, I, 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 it depends on your own space and your own experience. But like I spent $2,000 on an electric bike what's my success measurement that I use the damn thing, right? right? I'm not asking for someone to give me money back. I'm not being sponsored. So that I don't, I have no expectation of recouped investments. And I think a lot more audio fiction creators, those that have the means should probably consider it that way more. Success is more about are people listening? Are, are the people that I care about listening? Am I getting opportunities to be cast in other shows? Have, have I made good networking with other people? Can I maybe even be paid to do some other stuff on the side? Those sorts of things I think get interesting for success, but it really boils down to why you do this. There's a guy named Dave Slusher, friend of mine, longtime podcaster. He's one of the few people that I'm friends with have been podcasting longer than I have. Years ago, he asked that question of his audience on the podcast is how many listeners do you need, right? Because we've all realized that, look, if I have 100 people listening to me, that's probably not going to be a monetary success. But if I was to show up at my local coffee shop and 100 people would show up to hear me read my book or to do my presentation, I'd consider that pretty damn successful, right? Mm -hmm. So, So Dave's question was simple. How many people, what is your minimum threshold? What's the lowest number of people, number of listeners that you want or that you need to keep your show going? He says, everyone should ask him that question. Everyone should ask yourself that question because when you, when you hit below that number, then you stop doing it. Now, Dave answered the question. He said the number is one hmm. himself. If he still wants to keep making the show and listening to the show, he'll keep doing it. But when as soon as it becomes a bore and a chore and he doesn't want to do it anymore, he'll simply stop doing it. So I think you have to answer that question uh, on your own, but don't think about it only in terms of money. Success can mean a lot of different things. So what's next for you? Well, there's a thing I'm calling, I'm, I'm tentatively calling it the Fiction Podcast Preservation Project, FPPP. Hmm because that's an acronym. (laughs) So uh, FPPP is the idea here is you do a show, you had eight episodes and you have to pay your 15 or $20 a month hosting bill for the rest of your life, or you put it up on Anchor and eventually it just kind of goes away. Look, there are some really good shows out there that we've lost because the person who was responsible for them didn't want to keep spending the money to keep the hosting up there and live. And I get it. I totally understand it. So I have a, a, a picture of my brain. I need to get some support behind it. Hey, megaphone, if you're listening, um, I need to get people behind it that can that can help with that. But I have an inter- some interesting ideas of how we can keep those things preserved so that the show that you listen to today is still there 30 years from now. The second project I have going on right now is, so I'm a big fan of Reddit. I know the Keith, you occasionally uh, attend some time on the Reddit as well. I do. But, you know, Reddit also had a meltdown recently and a lot of people are looking at different options. So I am working on a service that is called uh, Hot Audio Fiction, hotaudiofiction.social. I wouldn't recommend going there right now. (laughs) It's very, very early days. But the best way I can talk about Hot Audio Fiction is what if you took Reddit but made it only about audio fiction, not just a single, like the audio drama subreddit, not, not just simply that, but more along the lines of what audio, the, the audio drama lab has done, where there's lots of different channels and conversations going on. But instead of making it for creators, it's primarily for people who love audio fiction. 
So mm-hmm. they can go and have a Reddit-like experience. You can have your own subreddit. We call them magazines for a stupid name on the service that we're using and have that full experience. But it's also federated, which is another big, big thing for me, getting off the big social platforms. So uh, that is a, a project that is underway. And yeah, and my goal is to, you know, if it works, it's again, all these things are experiments, is have that become a big place where people go and share and, and talk about the audio fiction that they love. And also people like yourself can go talk about the audio fiction that they make. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I mean, I've, I've been doing this now for just over a year, as you mentioned. Uh, it has taken up a majority of my life. I spend between 15 and 20 hours every single week curating all of this stuff for the end. And I love every minute of it. Does it make me any money? No, no, not really. I mean, thanks to the handful of people who have generously contributed some money uh, on a monthly basis. I do appreciate that. But by and large, it is a labor of love. It's something that I think needs to exist. And I think it's been missed in the industry. So I'm, I'm going to keep on doing it. The End is a great resource for listeners looking to find a new show or to just see what's out there. You can sign up for Evo Terra's newsletter at theend.fyi and keep an eye out for him at podcast conferences everywhere. I want to thank Evo for his time, and I want to thank you, my listeners, for two years of conversations with creatives. The first episode of is written and produced by W. Keith Timms. All the opinions expressed in this show belong to the people who expressed them and not necessarily to anyone else. The theme song is Mockingbird by David Mumford. This show is a production of Alien Ghost Robot Creative Media. If you want more information, want to sign up for our newsletter, or are an audio drama creator and would like to be on the show, visit our website at thefirstepisodeof.com. We're happy to be a part of the Audio Drama Lab, a Discord-based resource for audio drama development and networking. Check it out at audiodramalab.com. Keep telling stories. It's the only way we're going to get out of this mess. Until next time. I know you got questions about him. Where did he come from? How did he do all those things they say he did? Was he a terrorist? Was he crazy? Was his skin really blue? Well, I'll tell you what I know. I was there with him, driving through the back roads under the stars. I was witness to wonders and miracles, and to the darkness that's coursing through the veins of our country. He came to fight it in his own strange way, but no one leaves that fight unchanged. Not even Rael. People ought to know the truth. And I was there. The Book of Constellations is a down-to-earth sci-fi road trip. It's audio fiction, and you can find episodes at bookofconstellations.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, it's Keith. Have you ever thought about creating your own audio drama? Ever wanted to make your first episode of something? Then you should know about the Audio Drama Lab. It's a Discord-based resource for audio drama development and networking. You can connect with other creators, find actors and musicians, and even incubate your idea with step-by-step advice, accountability, and encouragement. Check it out at audiodramalab.com and start telling your story.